The following interview was conducted with Estelle Ringo for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, uh, September 23rd, 2008 at a residence in West Lafayette. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. And thank you very much. And tell us where you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. Uh, I was born in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I had one brother who was 10 years older than I was. Uh, so he was sort of more like a second father than he was a brother. Um, we lived in, uh, we were very middle class and lived in an apartment, never had a house. And most people in Brooklyn lived in apartments. Okay. Never owned a car because in New York it was more of a hindrance than a help. Um, what was, er, tell us where you went to school and also high school, a little bit about early years. Um, well, I went to a, a elementary school that was uh, a half a block from my apartment building um, and then went to uh, Winthrop Junior High School and Samuel J. Tilden High School um, uh, and finished in, God, what year was it, 1954 or something like that. Right. What was, did, any activities or what was that, in athletics or anything in high No, school? I wasn't, you know, those, in those days, girls didn't really participate in athletics. We weren't supposed to sweat. <laughs> I did, no, however, I in gym swimming. class. Yeah, yeah, everybody well, had gym class. In, in gym class, I, I was a terrific softball pitcher. Good. <laughs> But, um, you know, beyond that, um, I was mostly a watcher. I okay. did, over the course of my growing up years, learn to play tennis, and I learned to ice skate, and I, you yeah, know, I did all the Ice things. skating is yeah, fun. Right. Yeah. Um, and then... And uh, after high school. After high that? school, went to... Started at the City College of New York, which at the time that I was going, there was no city university. Each of the city colleges was an independent place. Now they're all joined under the banner of the city university. I started at uh, city at city college. I was majoring in marketing. What particular school of the of the uh, were you going to? Just I was called the Baruch School of Business. Okay. Okay. It was on Twenty mm, Third Street in Manhattan. So every day I took the subway from Brooklyn to Manhattan. And uh, unfortunately, after a year, a year and a half there, my father's, uh, the company that he worked for went bankrupt and he was out of work. Um, and at his age, of course, it was very difficult to find another job. My father was, um, he started out as a fabric salesman uh, and then over the course of years, um, the company that he worked for manufactured goods out of fabric and he would buy the fabric for them. Um, and um, he uh, was out of work for uh, well over a year and it was impossible for me to continue. Uh, I really had to go and get a job. Sure. And so I did. I worked in the office at the Singer Sewing Machine Company in Lower Manhattan the main off the main office sure. of that for a while. I did uh, transfer to Brooklyn College and go to night school there for a period of time. Um, while you were working, while I was working, okay. yeah, I was working full time job and then would take courses. And I changed my major to journalism. Uh, worked on the um, uh, Brooklyn College newspaper for a short period of time. And then uh, it just got, be, got to be a little much, and so I just dropped out of school, and I never got a degree. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, I continued working uh, for other companies. I worked for a variety of companies, and the last place I worked was for a, uh, a small publisher of trade magazines, mostly for the boating industry, and um, ended up as the, of all things, business manager of this company. By that time, I had met my future husband through a friend, okay. uh, and we were engaged. He was about ready to graduate. And by the way, my husband went to the same high school that I went to, 
but there were probably five or 6,000 students in that high school. And I was a little ahead of him, and we never knew each other at that time. That often happens. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, but in any case, we met, um, and we were engaged, and he was graduating from Brooklyn College, um, and um, was advised to go to graduate school, had applied to a variety of graduate schools, and the first graduate school to reply to him was Purdue, uh, which had in his field, which was audiology and speech sciences, a very fine program. Uh, and they offered him um, a, uh, an assistantship to come, and he accepted. And uh, he was going off in January, and then we were supposed to get married the following June. And uh, somewhere around November, we sort of looked at each other and said, why are we waiting to get married? <laughs> so uh, we went to my parents and said, we would like to move the wedding up. Uh, and so um, rushed off to the, you know, caterers and all that. Sure. And indeed, we did move it up to January. And were married on January 18th, and three days later, arrived in Lafayette. <laughs> How did you, come, did you take the train? Or? We flew. Oh, okay. Now, there was an airline that flew, uh, you know, you changed in Chicago, and you took this Lake Central Airlines into, went into West Lafayette. Well, we got to Chicago. Now, you realize this was in January. The Midwest had had a humongous ice storm, uh, all flights were canceled uh, the day that we got in to Chicago. That's another story. <laughs> and um, we ended up the next day, the only way we could get down here uh, was to take the train. And so we, we rushed down to Union Station in Chicago and got on the John Whitcomb Riley, which came down through Lafayette. <laughs> It was mobbed because there were so many people in the same. Sure. And I must tell you this story. Please it's do. very funny. Yeah. Uh, the uh, red caps put the luggage on the train, but they it was so crowded that what they did was they spread our luggage out for in, in the vestibules of each car where there was room. And I said, um, Bob, how are we going to get the luggage off the train in Lafayette? And he said, well, the red caps... We'll take it off in, in Lafayette. I'll give them the, the baggage checks. Uh, well, we arrived in Lafayette, and there were no red caps. There wasn't even a station. There was just this long, empty platform downtown near the river. And we I have the old station that was that they well moved. yeah the, the, the I, yes building, the yes building was there but but the train you know didn't stop close to that okay I got off the train my husband ran through the train throwing our suitcases off from each car and I and dressed in my New York winter clothes which were not suitable for the Midwest and I mean high heels and long coat. And I stood at one end of the platform and watched him throw the last bag off and jump off the train as it started moving out of the station. And I stood there and I looked around me at, and it was a terrible part of town. I mean, at this bare, ugly, gray, icy. And I said, I want to go home to my mother. <laughs> But I didn't. Was there no? Was there a taxi there? Uh, well, we finally found a uh, a phone, and uh, we were able to call for a taxi. There were no taxis there. Right. I mean, um, and uh, we came and we um, went to the union because uh, the apartment that we were supposed to get was not going to be ready for a few days. And so we went to the union to, to, to get a room. And um, they, the gentleman at the desk said, 
told us what it would cost, and my husband said, well, if we have to stay for a week, that's just going to be too much for us to pay. We had no money, basically. <laughs> we were both pretty poor kids. And so he, they, they said, well, we'll find you a room. And they did find us a room in the basement of the Union Club, which... And that room now, I believe, is a storage area or something like that. It was so small that you had to sit on the bed if you wanted to open the dresser, you know, that kind of thing. But, you know, and there were feet walking by on the, you know, through the window. But it was $3 a night. <laughs> we'll take it. You know, we'll anything. take it. That's right. Whatever. Right. Do you know that when my husband, and I think it was when he stepped down from uh, his uh, provost position and went back to the department. There was a reception, and the people at the union actually went back and found the original check in card. Oh, no. Yes, for us. I recognized the handwriting on it. Then oh, everything had been, uh, I guess they must have microfilmed or something, you sure. know, all the old, but there it was. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. It was a wonderful yeah. thing. Anyway, we were here, and he was a graduate student. I was in 1959 in January, and the university was a very different place than it and is now. It, so one of the areas or questions that I ask many mm -hmm. people certainly is the 50s and 60s. I know, or the some I've done on the 40s, 40s as well. So we're interested yeah. in campus. Yeah. Um, what, but first of all, after you, what was your first move after you, you finally got out of there? And oh, we, we moved into married student housing, okay, that's which what, was the bricks that are right next to the football stadium, which are now undergraduate housing, I believe. Uh, they were married student housing at the time. Now, before that, I think the married student housing were the old Quonset huts. I've heard. Right. That was what they were originally after the Second World War. Right. Uh, we were lucky. <laughs> they, had, they had the bricks, and we moved into there. Um, and it was wonderful. I mean, graduate school is, is, is wonderful because everybody's in the same situation. And, right. uh, they were all married couples around us. Um, some of them had children already, you know. And it was a very, it was a good, it, it, it was, you know, a tiny little place. But it was a good, good right. way to be. But the university was a very different place from now. In um, what? In how? Well, I think there were probably twelve thousand students on campus. Okay. Total. Um, mostly undergraduates. Mostly undergrads. Okay. Yeah, mostly undergraduates. Um, because we had no none of the professional schools here. We didn't have a law school, and we didn't have a medical school. And, and the vet school was not and, here at and, that time. Uh, and it, it opened in '59. Was it? That's when we arrived. Oh, so so they, it was just, just yeah, right, okay, right, right. And that was the only thing, you know. Um, so it was mostly undergraduates. Sure. And um, where was his? Uh, where was the audiology and speech science? And when we first arrived, it was oh god, what was the name of the building? It was in the basement of one of the old buildings. Would well, that have been Pierce Hall? No, oh. it was. Or but Stan near Stanley Coulter? Or? It, I, it may have been in Stanley, the basement of Coulter. It may have been. Okay. All I can remember is going down there and feeling like I was in a cellar because the pipes were all running through and there were, I mean, it was a terrible place for a speech and hearing clinic. Oh, yeah. And they were, uh, very shortly after that, they built Hevelin Hall and the speech and hearing program got the space in there. Right. So that was... Uh, a 200% improvement oh, over absolutely. where we were. Sure. You know. But um, I must, at that time, I think, I think it still was that um, the women could not go into the union in pants, in slacks. You had to wear a skirt. The, uh, the students. Um, and I don't think anybody could go in in shorts. Uh, at that time. It was a very formal. And um, I have to tell you this story. We lived facing, uh, our windows faced the uh, 
stadium and the practice field, the old practice area. And um, we were on the upper second floor of the, of the building. And during football season, one day, I mean, we could see the kids practicing, you know, and, but it was all closed off from the public because it had big uh, canvas things around the practice area, okay? One day, there was a knock on my door during practice, and I opened the door, and there was this young man who turned out to be uh, one of the football team managers, I think, and he came and said, Coach Mollenkopf says that you should please close your blinds because he doesn't want anybody looking over the practice. So I did. <laughs> Never know when there's going to be a spy for the team, you know, the, the well, opponent, you know, you watching thinking practice. Those days they're thinking about that. I mean, oh, yes, you know, absolutely. It was fascinating. Anyway, we were here for three and a half years. Did you? What did you do while you were here? Oh, I got a job. Okay. I had to. We had to eat. Sure. Uh, you have to understand that the assistantship paid $170 a month. Uh <laughs> I got a job. I was working as a secretary in the horticulture department. Okay. Okay. And, um, however, I became pregnant. Um, and we had our first child, uh, you know, like a year and a half into this thing. And suddenly, and in those days, if you had a child, you stayed home with that child. You didn't go to work. So uh, somehow we managed to eke our way through this and our first child was born here in Lafayette and a little boy and it's great and um, and it was fine and then in 1962 my husband got his PhD and we left and went to California he went to uh, what really was a postdoctoral research position at UCLA Medical School and we were there for uh, almost two years and then he got a faculty position at Ma at University of Wisconsin in Madison. And so what, was it, what was it like in California? Did you enjoy it out there? Yes, I mean, we enjoyed it. We lived, you know, we, we weren't there long enough sure. really to, um, you know, get into, right. and, and we didn't have a heck of a lot of money, and it was right. more expensive there, oh, you yeah. know. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, so we lived in an apartment uh, in in Los Angeles, not not terribly far from the university, and it was fine. I mean, uh, you know, we enjoyed it, and we sure. met other yeah. people, and we had some friends who lived out there, and you know, um, and it was a shock uh, to leave because we went from Los Angeles to Madison, Wisconsin, of course, in the winter. <laughs> Your arrivals in the winter seem to be oh, synchronous. Yes, yeah. and it's wonderful. Yeah, it's wonderful. Anyway. Uh, so we were in Madison, and I, Madison was wonderful. It's a great, it was a great town to live in, and we were there before the upheavals of the Vietnam War and all sure. that kind of thing. So um, it was a lovely campus, and it was a lot of fun. And you know, um, and by this time we had had our second child in Los Angeles, so we had our two sons, and um, we were in Madison for two years. At which point. Um, my husband was offered an associate professorship with tenure here. And I must tell you that when we had left and started our drive out to California... Oh, you drove? Uh, oh, yeah, sure, we drove to California. Well, we made it a little, you know. Uh, exactly. Yeah. With the children, it's with easier. The, yeah, so, right. Yeah. So uh, I remember uh, sort of as we drove out of town looking over my shoulder and saying, I'll never see that town again. And four years later... I was back, <laughs> but it was good because we knew, you know, the university and we knew the people and it was fine. Yeah. And um, our, uh, we arrived here in the summer of, of uh, 66. And at the time, um, the university owned uh, houses, little tiny national homes, opposite Happy Hollow Park. Down there near Catherwood? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And um, we rented one of those um, and were there for a year. And then we built our first house in 
way out of town in Barbary Heights, right across the, the bypass, <laughs> right across Sagamore Parkway, which wasn't Sagamore Parkway at the time. Sure understand. Um, you know, and people wondered, why in heaven's name would anyone live that far out of town, you know? <laughs> but it was a new area, and, you know, all sure. young people, and and we were there for 20 years in that house. And, and so my husband was an associate professor in the department, um, and uh, loved teaching, loved research, was very, very busy. And I'll tell you what the university was like then. Um, this would be about the 70s when? Uh, this was six, well, we came back in 66. Okay. okay. In 1967, uh, having been here a year, uh, I was informed by the wife of our department head that um, that um, Mrs. Hovde, Fred Hovde was president at the time, Mrs. Hovde, every year there was a new faculty reception. In, and I don't know if, if President Cordova is doing this too. You don't hear much. But they, just, the Jiskies did it, uh, you know. Right, at, I think. Yeah. Uh, and uh, all at, the presidents at Westford, had. At, I think yes, so. exactly. Right. Right. Well, at the time, the Hufties were living over on 7th Street. Street. Right. Um, and they would have, in September, they would have this uh, reception. And I was informed that the second year wives were um, requested to pour for the reception. It was in September, and it was a typical September, hot, sunny. We were told that we had to wear gloves and a hat. And it was... pictures. Yes. And it was outside in the backyard. It was a, you know, it was a long, narrow backyard, and they had set up the tables. And I, it was very hot, and I unfortunately was um, assigned to pour coffee from these, you know, it's a big urn. Well, nobody was drinking coffee, obviously, and I'm just sort of standing there, but the problem You couldn't was, sit down? You had no, to stand? No, you stood. You couldn't sit down. You stood. And um, what was happening was the sun was reflecting off the silver urn in front of me right on my face. And I was standing there with my white gloves and my hat, and there was rivulets of perspiration <laughs> running down my body. <laughs> it was the mo but it had to be done. And I, I, I think I probably poured two cups of coffee in that whole, you know, thing. Oh, oh my. It was, yeah, you know, that's, but that was, what was the done. way it was done. Right. You know. Right. Anyway, I, and, and believe me, I have been at, you know, I've watched over the years, it's been fascinating. I bet, yes. To watch the changes, to watch, first of all, we, we were here for the years of the maximum growth of the university, when it just sort of exploded, you know. Um, and we've been through, let's see. Of D. Hansen, yeah, I mean, Beering, Hicks, yeah, <laughs> and 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 we knew John Hicks very very well. I'm you sure know, you did, you right? Know. Yes, but uh, all the presidents, you know, so you know, right through well, Jiski. Let me ask you a question: mm -hmm. uh, the president's house on Seventh Street. Were you ever inside there? What was what was that like? Do you know? You know, I, I don't. People I don't. I don't. We don't have much material. We just know. From the debris that they lived there, but, yeah, and yeah. even talk. They don't. He never discussed the house. And the I house. Just wondered. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know because, of course, was there ever anything I, inside? That I you don't went remember huh. ever being inside that house, except that one time when I walked through it sure. to get to the back. Right. Did they have a large backyard then? It wasn't huge. Okay. It was, it was a, a nice sized backyard. Sure. But it was probably not much, no wider than the house was, and it just was long and very formal. I mean, it was a formal garden kind of place. Mm -hmm. it, you know, I passed it because I knew, knew that yeah. what the house number, but I yeah. it was never in the house. Yeah, and if I remember, as I walked through it, I remember it being uh, very formally furnished, ex especially since I was walking through the main. 
the public rooms basically right. of this house. Right. Yeah. And it was it was a formal ready for setup, it, uh, you know, reception or something. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I really as as the wife of an associate professor I really didn't have much contact with the Hufties. <laughs> <laughs> I understand they used to have some receptions maybe in the for the new people or may, not necessarily the new people but once a year yeah sort of a dinner dance or something oh like, I, maybe yeah I don't remember it might have been, might have been in the u union or something yeah like that, so yeah kind of probably thing. was I, for that for something like that it sure. would have been yeah. yeah it would have been in the right. it would have been in well the continue union. on then after because I made some you know I gave you some notes some of the things he's made some changes then after you moved up after he was head of audiology speech. yes uh what happened was that um not too long after we came back, um, the uh, head of the department um, retired, and um, right. Bob was offered the headship, and um, accepted it, um, and was head for a few years, and then Dean Ogle, um, I retired. Uh, he was dean of uh, humanities and social Social science science, and education I guess it was all together at the time and um, I don't know how that happened but Bob was offered that job did he come home and tell you is that how you or oh no I mean you know there was there was a I was several people who were being considered but so we went through the process you know and okay yeah and um, and he was offered that position and um, and that was fine. I mean, you know, um, it was challenging for him. He never stopped teaching because he loved to teach. Right. And one of the things that I kind of enjoyed and that I missed later on was the contact with students. Uh, because whatever class he was teaching, and they were usually graduate classes, uh, at the end of the semester we would have all the students over right. for a pizza party or something like that. Right. As the years went on and things got busier and busier, it you just couldn't Where do that you, anymore, that's right. you know. Yeah. So that's right. That's right. Um, but it was very, it was a, a very interesting progression. Um, as he rose um, through the ranks, so to speak, uh, I found my position changing. You know, as the dean's wife, suddenly I was committed to a lot more. Um, social activity. Um, we we entertained. We were entertained. We were invited to everything that every department in the school put on. In fact, six months into the into the deanship, my kids said to us, "Aren't we ever going to have dinner together again?" And Lots that, of events. Oh, yes. Yeah. We could have been out seven nights a week. And so uh, we looked at each other and said, it's time to be more selective. <laughs> the family really had to come first. Sure. And so we cut back on uh, right. a How lot. old were the children at about that time? Uh, 13 and 10. Okay. Did they go when, to what? At Westford? West Lafayette schools. Sure. They went to Cumberland School and went on to... Junior high and high school, they sure. both graduated from mm-hmm. from West Lafayette. Okay. Um, and and it was a good life for, for kids. I mean, it was a wonderful place. Did you go to the uh, uh, athletics as well? Yes. Did. Oh, yeah. The children like to go to? Oh, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. That's nice. Absolutely. That's and there nice. were years when, when they were in high school, when they would sell programs for the football games so they could get in for free, right. you know, that oh, kind yeah, of thing. Right. Yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, you know, that, that, that was just a part of sure, life, right. you know. And uh, it, it was fun. And it was a good place to raise children. Right, it really yeah. was. Uh, at, at that then, time, th- safe after, and, Right, know. after that, then he moved up. He was to vice president of the, the dean, dean of the graduate, of the graduate school and right. vice president for research. At right. the time, was they right. were joined. And um, uh, he was, well, I guess he'd been dean for, what, Thirteen about seventy three to eighty six is what I yeah thought, thirteen approximate. years something right. like that yeah right. and then and he, he still moved, taught and he was still teaching he right. he taught at least one course a year 
Always. So you need to keep your finger in it because then when you have to step down and, and switch back, it's sort of hard to get back and get You know, while he, was, while he was dean, and in fact, I think even while he was vice president uh, and dean of the graduate school, I think he still had graduate students and he was still doing research. Um, and, uh, you know, so he was... Right, pretty he, busy. He was pretty busy. Right. He was pretty busy. And then from, you know, his dean of graduate school for a, a relatively short period of time, mm -hmm. just a few years. Uh, and then the provost, uh, well, it was executive vice president for academic affairs at the time. And um, he had been involved in, uh, you know, a lot of things that were going on in central administration so that everybody knew him pretty well and um, and he had always had always uh, maintained this wonderful uh, rapport with his fa with the faculty he was always thought of himself as a faculty member right. and so I think that that went a good ways towards him getting the um, position the, the next position up and talk about being busy. <laughs> I did. And it was, uh, it was, it was interesting because he went through, um, there was a difficult period of time when the Beerings came. The first year or two after the Beerings came was very um, difficult with, uh, with the faculty. Um, um, some things that were going on were creating this, uh, real rift between Steve Beering and the faculty and I think that my husband was um, it's hard. Hmm? It's hard. It's it was hard. very hard right. but I think he he really um, achieved um, some understanding both ways and was able to um, quiet the the uh, problems and um, had an excellent working relationship with Dr. Beering um, over the years. Yes. It was it was really very interesting to watch. Um, the hardest thing I think about being in any kind of central administration at a university are the times when when uh, the administrator has to say no to someone who's been a friend for a long time. And um, we lost a few friends because of decisions that had to be made that didn't that go occurs. their way. That occurs in other organizations as well. Of course it does, of right. course it does. Um, but what warmed my heart was how many friends we kept in spite of all the decisions that sure. had to be made, right? And um, so we, you know, we have I have now uh, a support system that's really great because right. I have friends who I've known for forty five years. Right. Let me ask you this: Did you ever um, have much co any contact with Dr. Hovde after he stepped down? Because he was still living in the community. Oh, no, okay. oh. my husband did. Oh, Bob okay. did. Okay. Uh, but on you uh, know he used to. Uh, there was this table in Sarge Oak. This big round, a round table. table, and yes. I, Ann Kirker, who was the veterinary medical library, and we'd often have dinner there, mm -hmm. and we would sit in the the bar, but mm -hmm. we could always see. In fact, sometimes when my niece or my nephews came uh, for a weekend of the game, we would yeah. sit there, and that he often would be there. There it may yeah, not with, be anybody with him, but he but would he be would there. be there. Yeah. Right. Um, after he um, stepped down, and after uh, he's uh, no, oh. uh, uh, sometime after he stepped down. He, I think he had a stroke or a heart attack or something. Uh -huh. Anyway, he was in rehab and he would have some kind of physical rehabilitation down at the, um, the sports uh, medicine area in the athletic oh, department. Okay. okay. And my husband at the same time was having some problems, um, back problems or something like that. And so he was going in there and there were times when they were sort of lying, you know, <laughs> next to each other, no. being worked on, and so they would chat, sure, you sure. know. And and he would, Bob would come home and, you know, say, well, I had a great talk with, 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 with some you know, sharing. And, yeah, you know. And um, 
it was that was it was very interesting it, it was it most interesting he said when when dr Havdi said to him after uh if when that when arthur hansen became president um, he kept waiting for the phone to ring and for, for uh, Hansen to ask his advice about things. And it never rang. And we never forgot that. Because exactly the same thing happens every single time. Yeah, I mean, I don't think um, that uh, when when Beering became president, I don't think he consulted <laughs> Art Hansen. And certainly, I know that Martin Juski did not call Steve Beering. <laughs> I don't <can't> imagine. <laughs> you know, but there was something I read that they asked Dr. Beering after, because he cleaned out his office. He said he had left a book. Some, uh, but I don't know whether it's what the book was. But he left something in the desk drawer. Oh, 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 oh! In the desk, in the, in, in the uh, president's office. In the president's office. I see. And okay. This, yeah, he probably did leave some sort of a te- uh, book of some sort. He, in the he popular, may have. Yeah, yeah, he may have. Because yeah. he likes books and things yeah. of that sort. So yeah. it's kind of a yeah. thing out there. But uh, you know, okay, but this is true. Everybody does it their own way. That's right. That's right. You know, and unless. Something from the past pops up, and you need, you know, to, you really to talk need to, to the consult. person who who was involved directly in that particular activity, yeah. you know, whatever. You're not going to, you know, <laughs> you do it your way, right? Um, and and that's the way we sort of ran our lives, you know. As he went from job to job, he never went back and talked to, you know, tell the people, you know, who came after him what to do. Yeah. And in fact, when he stepped down from the provost job. I don't think he was in Hubdi Hall for probably two years after he stepped out of that job. He just refused to go back and horn in, so to speak. Yeah. You know, to stay in the yeah. You the know, mind. I mean, yeah. and 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 he had, we had seen other other people uh, who sort of wandered around, you know, and they were like ghosts, you know, floating around yeah. because they couldn't let go. And uh, there are pe- many individuals yeah. that are like that, and yeah. you can't. There's nothing you can say. You, yeah, they ha- it has exactly. to come from them individually. Yeah. Absolutely, right? Absolutely. You know, I tell a little. This is for the thing, but I um, he had a special parking place, mm-hmm. and this friend of mine, I would drop him off at Grissom Hall, mm-hmm. and he stopped to talk to this friend of mine one morning, and he said. How come you get a ride? And he said, "Well, I just do." And he said, "Well, Estelle doesn't give me a ride. I have to take my own car." <laughs> he had a great sense of humor, he and then did. he went he on to Deep Hall. You did. know, I he I did. knew him, but he was really, really he nice. He did. He you really know? did. So you you really covered pretty much. How about some of the university events, like the commencement and distinguished? Well, went to right. every. But they're all big. Those are big, and they do yeah. they do a nice a yes. nice job. It, the commencements are wonderful here. They really are. They this university really is probably one of the you in the country that actually hands the students their right, diplomas right uh, and that each kid gets a chance to march across that stage is a miracle right they and they just continue do with a fantastic job with right. it it's exhausting for the people who are up on that platform especially you know, for to do it you got yeah you got four commencements did he to go do. did he go to the regional campus uh, when he was vice president when he was vice president uh, and dean of the graduate school, he did because the regional campuses reported to him as dean of the graduate school. Okay, um, that was one of the things that now I don't know whether they still do, but they all reported to At him. So time. there were times when he was, for instance, going back and forth between here and Indianapolis to IUPUI weekly. You know, uh, because of because the, of, of the liaison or the contact. Yes, exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. Well, Doctor uh, Baring went to uh, all. Oh of yes, too, right? absolutely. And he so, did. at that time, did Doctor Ringel also go? Would he go to those commencements as well? Some of them, oh. uh, but as time went on, it, there wasn't any need for it. Okay. I mean, because he had no, you know, no, I mean, no need no, for him to be there. no need for him to be there. Right. But we were certainly, and I was certainly at uh, all four of the commencements up here. Right. And um, uh, it was interesting, um, you know. Uh, it's a little. It was a little bit different after the after the Jiskies came. I must say, the Beerings were still very 
formal. Uh, not quite as formal as the Havdis. <laughs> but um, as a senior people, I, we were expected to dress a certain way. Um, we didn't wear pantsuits to commencement. We wore skirts and dresses and things like that. And, um, and on uh, all special occasions. Um, you know, the ladies were expected to dress a certain way. Um, and uh, you just, you just did it. That's all. Exactly. And you, you just did. had to do it. Yes, right. exactly. You did. That's right. Yeah. You know, you had your formal wardrobe. <laughs> Always black and gold. <laughs> gotcha. You know, there's a quote, and I put this on the record, mm. That uh, uh, my wife tells me that when I come home, she can tell if I've taught that day. My step is lighter, my shoulders are higher, and I'm smiling more. That's really nice. And they have, I read the article, and it's mm -hmm. the picture in there that's yeah. very nice. A um, couple of oh, move, um, great. I want to talk about the the Ringo Gallery. Uh huh. Yes, yes. I think that uh, how that came about, and I think it's a wonderful mm -hmm. for both of you. Sure, it is. Um, how it came about? Well. Um, it's a great location. It is a oh, great location. Even and where it was before was lost because people never went beyond. If they were going to the alumni office, mm -hmm. then that was it. There was yeah, nothing. They, yeah. Or if they were going to the ballroom or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, he had uh, fought for, I mean, I think probably from the time he was, uh, you know, dean, um, he had really wanted to um, have uh, a gallery spaces. Uh, at this university, um, and there were there was very little. And was the one? Uh, excuse me. Was the one in Stewart Center? Was that open? The that was in? there. Okay. Um, somewhere then, along the line, although I don't know what year sure, it was. Okay. Um, I think maybe that was when they did some remodeling in the library or something like that. I think that, maybe that the last space renovation they got. Before, 58, so yeah. that probably was when it was could yeah. have been yeah. somewhere along yeah. the line. But um, when they were doing, you know, I guess some more moving people around and everything, and um, he really fought for that space in the Union. Um, he just really believed that um, I, it didn't matter to him that the university might think of itself as a an engineering and agriculture school or whatever, that it had grown to be a complete university and that the students who were here should have the opportunity to be exposed to every kind of culture. And he fought for that space and he finally got it. Um, and um, we were thrilled. I mean, it was nice that it was there. Right. The year that he was, the year that Steve Fearing was going to retire, um, we had been invited along on one of the president's council cruises. I mean, invited. Well, you know, you sort of went on the cruise and you worked, um, which was fine. I mean, yes. we met lovely people. We really did. <laughs> um, and I know you both enjoyed it as yeah, well. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, but uh, Steve Beering took me aside on the cruise, and he he couldn't he couldn't keep it to himself. You know, that that board had decided to name the gallery after Bob. And he said, "But don't tell him. It's supposed to be a surprise." Of course I won't tell him, Steve. <laughs> and um, I, it, I must say that that action was the most gratifying to me, and I know to him. I mean, I, I don't think the university could have done anything more wonderful for him than it to... It was a capstone for yes, what he wanted to, exactly, to bring to the university. Exactly. That was really great. And, you know, and of course, I did tell him, and then Steve told him. <laughs> and he was, he was really so happy, so thrilled with that. It's very nice. And uh, it was, you know, our 
our pleasure to be able to you know support that and, right. and uh, that's nice yeah. that's really nice it really was the other wonderful. thing is that great book of teachers that he really worked very hard for for yes, yes. and yes. I remember I went to the initial ceremony because this friend of mine got in, in it was it one was of the inaugural and it was wonderful yes and the Academy Park really yeah. nice yeah yeah. And uh, I think that great picture that was in the inside years ago with the little boy paint, pointing to yes. his... Yes, that, isn't that a wonderful That's a classic, picture? and he's pointing to his, to his, his grandfather. grandfather. Right, it's wonderful, you know. Yeah, you know, I have to I have to say this, you know, probably shouldn't, but I have to say it. Um, the, the first year that they were putting, you know, putting up the plaques and we were going to have the first, you know, inaugural, and I said, Bob... You should be on that plaque. You are one of the great teachers. You have taught some of the... I mean, his graduate students adored him. He, he was wonderful. His undergraduate students adored him. You know, he, he just was a wonderful teacher. He said, I can't do that. I'm the one who wanted the thing. I'm not going to have my name on there. <laughs> The artist signature down there. Yeah, <laughs> uh, he said. He said I can't. He said I shouldn't be on there, you know. But I know that he always hoped that sometime in the future, his name would end up on that plaque. Yeah. You know. It may. It may. It still may. Go. It I may. don't know. I don't know. I agree with you on that. You know. Were so. you involved with the um, uh, Purdue Women's Club at all? Uh, only at the very when when the first. Oh, I when don't you know, first came. Years. Well, we were in, yeah, I was in the newcomers, you know, sure, when we right. first came and so forth and so on. But, you know, it was, it was funny. I don't know why. Um, well, I was kind of busy, first of all, with other things. I and mean, you had I, the children, too. I had the children. Well, we all had children, sure. you know. But, um, but I was involved with other things in, right. in the community. I was involved with, very much so, with our temple here. And I, you know. Um, and I didn't play bridge. See, they had bridge groups, and I didn't, and I wasn't a gourmet cook, so I, and I just, after we got past newcomers, I sort of couldn't find any place to fit in, you know, so I would go once in a while, but I really was not an active right. member, and, you know, years later, I thought, you know, that was silly, I should have really yeah. found my way if through it. you've got other but, activities, and sometimes they, just, they conflict with what yeah. you've got going, so that's okay, yeah. However, right. you know. Let's talk a little bit about the awards and honors, many of the ones that he's gotten. Oh, dear. <laughs> um, well, I suggest the Distinguished Alumnus Award from Brooklyn College. Yes. Mm -hmm. Did they, uh, usually I ask the people, was there any advance notice? Or did he? Oh, yes, yes, okay. yes. I mean, he was, he was informed that he would, so okay. that he would be there. Okay. You know, and he was there. I was not, um, but he was there, and both our mothers attended. Oh, nice. So. That's nice. Nice. And that was wonderful. So we have pictures of him with his medal and that's very nice. His yeah. mother and his mother-in-law. <laughs> Another one was that honors of the from American oh, Speech and Hearing, Hearing Association. Yes. Now honors of the association is the highest honor that that association can give, and you have to be nominated. You by you know on a and get variety of letters people of and letters of sure absolutely. And then the, there's a committee that sits and decides decides and um and with it all i mean not only had he produced seminal research in the field and had produced wonderful graduate students who were now faculty members in a variety of places and were doing good work themselves um but he had been involved in the in the um legislative arm of the you know, association. So it, the association and um, they knew him well and that was uh, that was a great occasion for us I, think so. I was there and, yeah. and it was wonderful did they give him is it a plaque oh, yeah, that he gets yeah. that's oh, nice yes, absolutely yeah. um, and uh, and that was a good yeah, a wonderful year yeah. you know, for him and then the Donald S. Powers Distinguished Administrator I, that was it, it's it represented I mean a first I guess uh, as opposed to a, a you know a distinguished faculty person uh, Don Powers had endowed this 
you know, it was like endowing a chair, except right. it was an administration chair. And that was wonderful. He and, and Don Powers, who was on the board for many, many years, right. they got along wonderfully and they worked well together. Um, and uh, it was a great honor. I mean, and, and uh, you know, I mean, it was hard to explain to people what that meant <laughs> because it's but you new and unique yeah well and yes it, there it, isn't totally one unique I, right. there aren't any uh, anywhere else as far as i know not that i'm aware yeah. of either you know so um but it was for his administrative ability that that's that just, he got that perfect you know that that's, chair that's perfect yeah <laughs> um now the campus changes we talked a little bit about that but chauncey village has changed oh much. of course it yeah chauncey yeah. village didn't exist when we first came. Wasn't, weren't there anything? Some people well, told me there was there. I there think there was a, a deck or uh, deets or something like that. Maybe yeah, been there Easter, but not anything. Oh, well, there like was it. nothing. There was no shopping center. Right, exactly. Um, uh, there was nothing. There was on the other side of the street, um, on State Street. There was oh god, and I terrible at remembering the names of things. But there was a, a women's. A small women's clothing. Elsa Lynn. Elsa Lynn, you got it. Yes, um, and really, and arts was there. Yes, when I came. Yes, that's right. absolutely. Right, and the bookstore. Right. You know, I right. think was still there. Was and there? You know, Follett's, I think. Follett's yeah, Follett's, there. yeah. Right, but and that was in that uh, that round was area. It. There was nothing, and of course, once you got past that, and you were down, all the way down the hill, there was nothing there. You know, Sears. I mean, Sears. Well, Sears was there, <laughs> but and then when the Sears closed, of course, I mean, there was nothing except the junkyard, you know. So, <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, that was a big change. Yes, it was. <laughs> okay. Uh, after he after he retired, then did you do some traveling, or what sort of things did you get? Um, well, right after he stepped down, we took. Yes, he 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 did. But he uh, came back and. and stayed for a couple of years and went back to teaching. Oh yeah, absolutely. Right. right after he stepped down, we were away. Um, he, In all the years that he had taught, we had never had a real sabbatical because he was in administration. Right. <laughs> we had, I think, in all those years, we had one four-month period of time between two jobs when they let him go away for, you know, four months. But we, this time, we did, uh, and we we spent part of the time in Arizona, um, in Tucson, at uh, university. He was working yeah. at the university in his field I, with with his with people that he knew mm -hmm. in, in the department there, and uh, we also went to um, Italy. We lived in Florence for almost two months, uh, and it was wonderful. Yeah. That was a a wonderful experience for us. We loved it. Yeah. And then we came back, and um, he went back to his department and uh, taught and specified, I think, when he went back that he wanted to teach undergraduates and did very successfully. The first year he came back, uh, the students voted him the Outstanding Teacher of the Year. And um, and he loved, loved it. He was back what he liked yeah, to do. He but. loved it. Yeah, he that's really right. Did. Okay, he really did. Uh, do you either of you have a favorite Purdue tradition? That comes tradition to or an outstanding event? Can you think of either that? Oh well, I can think of lots of uh, of outstanding events. Um, One or two, the kind. Of, but the for me, and I think partly for him too. Although that wasn't the most outstanding thing for him. I think the things that, that were most outstanding were the people that we met along the way because of his jobs. Um, we, That's very good. Yeah. Very, very key, I think. Oh, it is. It is. It, and not, and it's, a lot of them were just people that we met who were affiliated with the university or were graduates of the university. And, a friend you know, or a uh, Exactly. Sure. But some of them were people who came here. Uh, to speak, mm -hmm. Jimmy Carter, after he was president. <laughs> um, Ronald we, Reagan. Yes, um, Ronald Reagan, however, was just here for in and out. Jimmy Carter was here and and had uh, dinner right. uh, and spoke, you know, at the um, Hall of Music. And 
The most wonderful for me was Helen Hayes. That would be a been nice. Helen Hayes came to speak, and um, she uh, had a, a traveling companion, a woman that traveled with her. And Helen Hayes, uh, she didn't want a big deal to do, so I um, we had dinner at our home. Not this home, <laughs> the last home, um, for her and I, for a couple of other people from the university, of course, and uh, for her companion. And it was delightful. That's low key, just oh yes. In it. She ate nothing, and I kept saying, you know, was this she, after the performance? No, or after it was before the performance. She ate nothing, and she said, I cannot eat before performance because I am so nervous that I will throw up. Yeah. <laughs> there are people like that. I mean, yeah. she, in all her years of performing, never got over state fright. She was so tense before. And, of course, when she went on, she was wonderful, you know. But she was delightful and charming and I made her eat some dessert because I it was Pears Helen. <laughs> I said I made it just for you. Well, I didn't make it; the caterer made it. <laughs> but she was absolutely charming, and it was such a pleasure to listen to her talk about her life and everything, the people that she knew, and things right. that had happened to her. That's a real coup. That's yeah, really nice. Because she's wonderful. a wonderful actress. Yeah. Yeah. I've yeah. Never. I've seen her and mm. listened to her but I never had never yeah. met her you know she's really nice it was wonderful yeah. charming woman well, let's see any cl closing comments or anything that you'd like to think um, that you can think of well um what can I think of um I think uh that this university uh it's been through many ups and downs over the years that we've been here mostly ups and it's, it gave my husband a great deal, and he never forgot that. He loved this university, and everything he did, he did because he felt it would be in the best interests of the university. And I respected that, um, and I, there were times when I felt the university is taking too much of our lives. But I understood how he felt. And um, it gave me opportunities that I never would have had. Right. Never. Coming from my background in, you know, Brooklyn, going nowhere, you know. It was really special. That's really nice. It was yeah. really special. Very nice. Thank you, Mrs. Ringo. That's very nice. I appreciate it. You're quite that. welcome.